My clock is fast up here. Richard. Oh, Richard now. Good. Hi, Hi Richard. Richard. Hi, Richard. Who needs to tell you attention from U.S. government and other interested bodies? What <laughs> page are we on now, uh, Pam? <laughs> Pam, what page are we on? We're going to be on page 92, right? 92, yes. Yeah, I had to turn to my thingy. That's Accountability cool. of public officials. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I hope we're well, going to talk about modern well, day. <laughs> I, reading that title, yeah, I said I don't want that. Know, <laughs> I have a story about a public official in Spring, in Illinois a number of several years ago. And she was a very trusted employee. She was the treasurer of a small town called Dixon, Illinois. Oh. Um, in central, some north central Illinois. In fact, I think, isn't that where, I think Reagan was born in Dixon, if I remember right, but I'm not sure. Anyway, she never took vacations. She was always there, even if she's somewhat sick. She always made sure that all the treasure stuff was done. Well, there was a good reason why she never showed up. One day she got sick. She had to go to the hospital. So someone started to took over for the treasury for a while because they had to pay some bills. And guess what he found? Huh. She had embezzled the money. Lord, over the 20 years, she used it to uh, feed her habit of uh, horses. She was one of those horse <laughs> ladies you know, with, the, with the fancy horses. Yeah. You know, horse yeah. And, and uh, they learned a that bit. maybe you should have two or three people, just like the, the Talmud says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well let, us, let us go ahead and start uh, with the blessing and then... Um, Pam is going to lead us today, so we're going to have some fun with this topic, accountability of public officials. So let's do it together. Baruch, Lord, you sanctified us with your commandments. Is the most command us to engage in the words of the Lord. All that I got to figure out the way to get this voice out. Okay. Hold it. <laughs> there is Shirley. Yeah. Thanks, Shirley. And Donna, we see. I can, I can hear you. We can I can hear you, hear you a little bit. You. Not great. I can okay, see you. ma'am. Okay. He's all yours. Okay. So today we're discussing the um, accountability of public officials. Public money, public building, etc. So very interesting. What I found interesting about this is um, the, the way... Um, Moses was making sure that everybody contributed to the new tabernacle. It was mm -hmm. like, <laughs> we're going to, you're going to put, you're going to, you know, give something to the thing and you're going to do it. And we're going to get everybody to get all the, all the things for the new tabernacle. So okay. it sounded like he was a man with a plan. The, um, how do you want to start? How should we start? Should we start reading part of it? How do you? Should we... uh, I think what we should do is just basically discuss the subject matter and get comments, and okay. then we can go on. Great. So, comments about anybody had comments about this? Mia. Me, Mia. Mia. When I read this, the first thing that came into mind was Clarence Thomas, ah. <laughs> and I felt that. Um, it really does fit with today's reading entirely. Of, it's called accountability of public officials. Well, he's a public official, but he's never been accountable. And I feel that someone like that, who was supposed to be on the up and up all the time, has proven to be just the opposite. And I guess because he's a Supreme Court justice, there's nothing we can do about it. Is that true? Does anyone know what the laws really are? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Marcia? Uh, well, <laughs> who's moderating? Um, what I can see is that the there is no, amongst the Supreme Court justices, they don't follow the ethics 
rules of the rest of the court system throughout federal included throughout right. the land. Because they're not required to. They're not required. Right. One senator, what is his name? Uh, is it either Sherrod Brown or it's Sheldon Whitehouse, who is trying to uh, bring up a rule that in Congress that they, that, or Senate, Senate, I don't know which, I, not sure which, but they're trying to set, have one of the uh, legislative houses uh, institute a law that would make them follow a law, an ethical laws, you know, a, a set of ethical rules, that yeah. gets this word for it. And so they're not being doing that right now, and they don't want to. They're fighting it. Uh, Roberts is fighting it, as well as Thomas and, you know, a whole bunch of them I'm in there who are, just don't want to be uh, held to any accounting, but we'll monitor ourselves. Well, you can't really do that yeah. because you're you're um, partial, you know, that's just the way it is. And mm -hmm. anybody who um, is taking favors from an, an outside source is going to, be, you know, generally uh, be more conducive to help that group, that, those people, you know. So well, the yeah, thoughts? they are trying. The uh, legislature is trying. To, somebody, a group, are trying to bring in some ethical rules. And yeah. I, it's amazing that we've gotten so far in our country all these hundreds of years that we've never had this situation before. And it's not just him. It's Roberts. It's Scalia, um, and it's hit at Tom, uh, um, and Thomas. Yeah, I see Jan uh, Nan's yeah. hand. Nan. Nan. No. Yeah, well, my, hold it, go to my, uh, my thought hold, hold about that. Nana's um, next. Nana's next. We're getting, off, we're getting political. My, off the yeah, no, but, it's the subject. But the, well, but, those are the names. I can't help it. They are the, the ones who are having favorites. I know, wait, but the problem. Wait, wait. Nan. But, yeah. All right. But the problem with the Supreme Court is that they are lifetime appointments. Yeah. If they had, uh, you know, if they changed the court so that it could be for 20 years or 25 and not give them this lifetime appointment, then, you know, and, and we've only had very few justices that have resigned or retired because of their age or health or whatever but i i think that's where the problem for some of this comes i mean but you could also look at our government the congress the people that are in congress and the senators the average age is what 72 or se some ridiculously high number hey don't if, look that i'm 81 and eight. well but if term limits if if they could do term limits, and, and I don't care, you could do four two-year terms for Congress and three six-year terms for Senator. I mean, I don't care, whatever they want to do. But because these people can just keep running and people elect them, you know, they they also don't have a lot of accountability. But in in biblical times, people didn't live as long. And um you know, they I I see part of this as a continuation from the Torah portion that I had last Friday, where, you know, Moses called upon everyone to contribute their whether whether they could give gifts of gold or or threads or their skills as carpenters or builders to make the tabernacle. Everybody became involved and that made them united um and so this you know this beginning part was like the continuation from that yeah it definitely sounded like a continuation of the last one about mm -hmm. everybody had to do a part on giving so, for the new tabernacle, tabernacle. Uh, and then uh, marcia was next i think well okay. i think richard's first right yeah richard followed so, by marcia Good thing. Number one, I don't think age should count into Congress, for instance, because we're old, but we're wise, you know, and I remember a psychiatrist telling me, as we get older, we have wisdom which builds up in us. Yes, we lose a little bit of our acuity and our quickness, 
Um, so oh, we yeah. should term limits. Yeah, are good. And the Supreme Court, well, there should be some things done. But when we get back to the Bible, there's real controversy, and, and sometimes we read too much into it. Like all this repetition, as as uh, um, is it Umberto? Oh, Casuto, Casuto, Umberto Casuto says that this is actually just the, the repetition is typical of sacred places that are commented on in uh, in in all the uh, Middle East biblical times. That that the various writings did this, but the rabbis, of course, disagree with them. Uh, because they want to make a moral judgment uh, of everything that occurs in the in in the Torah, so we're so we have to decide what is it really about? Is it just matters of of etiquette, or is it truly talking about accountability of public officials? Did they have the accountability? You know, three thousand, four thousand years ago, they probably did, but to a different extent than we had. Uh, Marsha's next. Feeding off Richard, I think there should be accountability. I think those rules of ethics should be in, uh, enforced, I guess is the word, in the Supreme Court as it is in the courts, all courts lower to that. And they, they, they should be an overseeing a committee, perhaps in Congress or Senate, that keeps an eye on them because they obviously are too weak as people as you know char their characters are too weak because they're not following it you know if he uh, it's the change in the whole uh ethics of society of people nowadays that wasn't over in past years i'm sure that things happened in the past too and we just didn't know about it but when it all comes out so much that when you was talking about it just gets to be overwhelming and it it makes people lose trust in their leaders yeah. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Because once you lose trust, then. Yeah. I don't know. All goes downhill. Yes. Yeah. The, only, the only way uh, Supreme Court justice can be um, um, removed is the same way a uh, uh, president can be removed. And that's, I think, three quarters of the Senate, or two thirds of the Senate, I can't remember, I think the three quarters of the Senate has to approve their removal. So it's near impossible to remove uh, a president or, in that matter, a, um, uh, a, a member of the Supreme Court. Hmm. It's easier to remove, I think, a senator uh, or a congressman. Obviously, we saw a congressman removed by simple majority um, 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 just from yeah. New York. DeSantis, yeah. But DeSantis. And he's running again. He's running yeah. It's so flagrant. It's unbelievable. Well, he's a he's a sociopath. You know? <laughs> yeah, and, he is. You know, very religious. I remember there was a very religious person. Uh, he was a con artist, and he was an Orthodox, <laughs> even a Hasidic Jew, I think. And he disappeared from the United States for a few years. I think he went to Europe or something. They eventually caught him, and he didn't go to Israel because yeah, he probably would have been caught there. But he went to, he went uh, to Europe, and eventually he was found, caught, and brought back to the United States and is probably still serving a, a rather steep sentence for, for what he did. But um, <laughs> so it doesn't matter if you're highly religious. You have to be religious and ethical. Yes. It's the ethics that are important, not the religion. <laughs> Next person, any thoughts? Hmm. Maybe we should start reading this thing and see where it takes us. I think that's a good idea. Who would like to read first? Then we can take turns. Minya, you want to read first? Yes. Accountability of public officials. The Torah portions by Akel Ikud repeat descriptions of the sanctuary construction, including long detailed lists of items donated by the Israelites. Biblical interpreter Don Isaac Abravanel counts five repetitions of building plans and donation lists within the Torah. The matter is puzzling, says Abravanel. Why keep on recapitulating such details? Commentator Ramban answers Abravanel by claiming that all the repetition reflects the love with which the sanctuary was viewed by God. 
Such repetition is designed to underscore its importance in the hearts of the Israelites. On the other hand, modern, commentary, modern commentator Umberto Casuto suggests that all the duplication is merely a matter of style. Ancient Middle Eastern documents, he claims, all contain repetitions of details, especially plans describing sacred places of worship. Early rabbinic commentators disagree with Casuto. They believe that the details and lists serve a very important function. Moses, they say, carefully records each charitable gift. Afterwards, he reviews the contribution and checks his list against others made by Bezalel and, oh, you know who it is. <laughs> then he rechecks each entry, making sure that none has been overlooked or misplaced. All this repetition, attention to detail, and recapitulation of what was given and how it was used is a matter of accountability. For Moses, the rabbis observe, accountability by public officials of what they collect and how they use it is a moral responsibility. Public officials must be re beyond reproach. Rep yeah, reproach. We should send this to the uh, Supreme Court. <laughs> Furthermore, rabbinic commentators teach that at least two people are to be appointed to look over the finances of a community. They point out that in the case of Moses, he was acting alone. And for this reason, he insisted on having all the account he supervised publicly audited by the people. The repetition, the repetition of the long list of donations and how they were used, the rabbis maintain, was the actual public examination of Moses' records. Let's pause for a minute. Uh, they said the, uh, the idea, I think, that we still have now is that we have other people who check on the work of those people. In fact, a lot of people, um, there was a company I know where the person refused to go on vacation. And the reason why is because, yeah. <laughs> you know, he was doing something to the books and he didn't want anybody to check. <laughs> uh, there was that lady in the oh, diction. Right. And Richard's story was the same thing, too. Yeah. And I saw it at the JCC in San Diego. Yeah. <laughs> it happened. You know, what bothers me about all of this is that no time is anybody elected. It seems to me that if you want the job, you take the job. And and that's as far as uh, as far as your responsibility goes. You're not responsible to anybody uh, as far as the Bible is concerned. Uh, you know, you're on that? your own, so to speak. It's not a good way to run a government. I, yeah. I don't understand what... Sai is saying that you how can you say you're not responsible to anyone? What I'm saying is that nobody <laughs> is making choices. The congregation is not saying you're the one that should be responsible. Somebody gets up, raises his hand, says, I will take care of the money. You know, and, and so what does all that mean? That's the problem if you read the book. Nobody, nobody is is responsible unless they want to be responsible. Um, Marcia? Our temple bo um, books are audited yearly. I don't know, once or twice. It's in our uh, wow. bylaws, rules, whatever they are put into, that there is an audit that has to be done. Somebody has to be looking and making sure that it's done appropriately. And if it's not, then something, you know, it, the person well, who isn't doing it right a, is going to be called on. But what? we voted for the people to do the audit. They just didn't get up and decide to do an audit. I don't understand. I can't understand what he said. Do you understand what he said? Okay, let it go. Oh, let it go, Marshall. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I think what, what, you're, what you're saying, um, let me interpret it, <laughs> uh, that, that, that public officials or any official, uh, the treasurer of our of our organization, for instance, doesn't necessarily, would not necessarily feel responsible for anything and may, and may have that kind of nature to be greedy. 
uh, uh, so you also have somebody, uh, or they may feel very obligated and do a good job. I think that's what you're saying, right? right. Like that, yeah. Oh, and so you right. no, we don't know. Maybe Moses was a little greedy. The relationship to the Bible. <laughs> I, guess they were, Moses I don't know about that. Yeah. In order to 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 uh, underscore this idea of, of accountability, Moses points to two two craftsmen. And they and they are the ones who then give Moses all the information, and he checks it over. Now, whether this was accountability or not, it's hard to say, you know, because you know, according to uh, Pseudo and, and he, the modern commentator, you know, ancient ancient uh, Middle Eastern uh, 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 groups. Uh, did this we did this kind of repetition in sacred because sacred uh, uh buildings because they probably felt their gods were then appeased by people talking about it a lot and and our god was appeased by building the things that he wanted to so we repetition a lot whether it's truly a a a, a um uh, a method of accountability i i can't say I just can say it's the interpretation of the early rabbis, because they're putting uh, a, a, a ethical uh, uh, ideas into the uh, Torah reading, or they're gleaning ethical ideas from the from the Torah. Are we so, ready? To, okay, Minya, can you follow up? Follow keep reading, up. I mean, reading. Keep yes. Reading. Why did Moses insist on such accountability? Was he not the trusted leader of his people? Could anyone have thought that he was misusing public charity? Apparently, that is the impression the rabbis believe Moses wanted to avoid. There are gossips in every community. Those who spread false rumors or question the integrity of public servants. Moses realized, say the rabbis, that there were those who would point at him and say, look how well he's eating and drinking. He's living off our money. He's getting rich from our donations. In order to answer such false rumors and gossip, Moses insisted that his accounting books be public and open to all the Israelites. The rabbis also claim that when Moses realized the people were giving more than Bezalel and Oho, Leah required for the building of the sanctuary, he asked God, what shall be done with the surplus gifts? God instructed him to build a special chapel inside the sanctuary. When it was complete, Moses reported to the people, we spent this amount on the sanctuary and with the additional funds, we built the chapel. Because he accounted for all the gifts, even the additional ones, Moses placed himself above suspicion. Which I think was a smart thing for him to do. Uh, that he wasn't under suspicion. I wonder if that's really actually in the Bible, if that's just an interpretation yeah. uh, um, that, that that Moses talked to God and said, oh, okay, let's build this extra chapel inside the big, big sanctuary. Um, that might be an interpretation. Oh, we we need a text, uh, 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 Rabbi Kaplan, and, uh, and and ask him. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's not. You think he'll answer? It is not an Exodus. It is in an Exodus Rabbah, which is what a, a, a commentary or interpretation. Right. Yes, it's That's an interpretation. not actually in Exodus itself. So I think uh, Richard is right in that respect. But a lot of Jewish temples do have little side chapels. Right. Maybe this is where it all started. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the big, the, uh, so uh, the big thing with the uh, big almost. cathedrals have little chapels along yeah. the walls. Yeah. Again, again, I always think of the Torah as sort of the Jewish uh, Jewish uh, equivalent of the U.S. Constitution. And the Talmud, uh -huh. the mission of the Talmud, is sort of an interpretation of those laws. Just so that that's at least my thought. Other thoughts? Actually, the founders of our Constitution were very aware of the Old Testament and used 
much of the Old Testament and its values in interpreting what they're going to put into the Constitution. As a matter of fact, um, originally the uh, emblem of our country was supposed to have been Moses parting the sea, uh, the Red Sea, and it was eventually voted, uh, voted down, but that was what originally was um, proposed as our official seal. Eventually, um, the other symbol came in, the eagle or whatever, uh, not even the turkey for that matter, which <laughs> ben Franklin had proposed. Uh, the national bird should be the turkey, not the American <laughs> eagle, right? I agree, I agree. Yeah. Uh, we don't founders were, were very much aware of the Old Testament and used many of the values in, in constructing the Constitution. Hmm. Other thoughts? Okay. Minya? Steve has a question. Oh, Steve. No, 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 Steve. I, I'm just going to make a comment. I think uh, repetition <laughs> basically just reinforces what, uh, what they are trying to accomplish and Therefore, it keeps keeps the um, the people uh, not necessarily um, accounting of what's going on, and therefore, you know, if it's repeated, it's 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 kind of like the law, so to speak. It's reinforcement, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. Reinforcement. Yeah. So. Well, the opposite is true. If you tell a lie often enough, people actually begin to believe it. So it is reinforcement of a negative uh, side to it. Right. Also. And, also. <laughs> yeah. and, and Hitler and our former president are doing the exact, did the exact same thing. Oh, with the Thanks election. for bringing that up, Steve. I didn't want anybody to say I was making a political statement. <laughs> we were trying I'm so just, hard. I'm, be, I'm just being honest. That's yeah. right. You are. Yeah. Yeah. You know, whether, whether anyone is a, uh, in agreement, yeah. it's up to them. I mean, you can you can decide for yourself how we can account our officials in 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 this instance. So, well. Unfortunately, a lot of our officials think they can say anything and get, you know, you know, you got to trust me, I say anything, this is, you know, follow along, and then it comes back to them, well, you know, it wasn't quite true, or it was an exaggeration, and it catches up to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Richard? Politicians are a completely different breed than the normal human. <laughs> um, they test the wind uh, and decide what what they'll do because they want to be elected, re-elected. It's like re -elected. President, yeah. President Biden now is is being very harsh on immigrants and the border because he sees that if he wants to get elected, he has to address this problem, which is perceived in this nation as something very dire. So, uh, unless, uh, unless even if he doesn't do it, he's going to do it. It's like what President Eisenhower did uh, with uh, with uh, the National Guard uh, and integration. Uh, when the Supreme Court ruled that integration had to proceed, and places like the University of Alabama and some of the other schools uh, uh, didn't want to, uh, or, or not the university, but the very schools, you know, in, in Kansas City, I think it was. No, no, it was in Southern Southern Schools, Alabama or Mississippi. They, they didn't want to integrate the schools. And those, the young little girl went there. She was black. He reluctantly called in the National Guard. He says, I don't want to do it. These people are my friends down there. He says, I come from Kansas, which really was a, a segregated state at the time. And, and uh, but... Um, he did it because the Supreme Court ruled it, and he said, I have to abide by the law. Mm -hmm. And so that was uh, something that I would say would be an unusual for a president, because people like, uh, uh, let's see, what's his name, um, Jackson, you know, when, when the Supreme Court ruled that what he was doing to the Indians, you know, putting them, you know, Andrew taking them the area, mm -hmm. they said, you can't do that. And he said, I don't care. And he did it. Hmm. 
And he got no repercussions for it because the people of the United States, they want the Indians gone. You know, they said, hey, we want their land. But back then, people, you know, without TV, people really weren't I'm watching. Thinking yeah, just no. the same <laughs> thing. Yeah, and they didn't yeah. care with the play of the Indians. a different Indian world now. Savages. Yeah. But yeah. you say something now and everybody in the country knows it immediately. <laughs> with their cell phones or something you know it's not the same as by the time trickle down effect with gossip and newspapers good grief it's totally different you know yeah yeah we have lester holt every night telling us what's what they're talking about <laughs> right yeah. other thoughts okay moving on yes you want someone else to read Oh, you're doing such a great job. <laughs> Stealing. It is better to eat a poor person's meal and be respected <laughs> as honest than to eat the richest meal and be hated for swindling and cheating others. Stealing is the worst of all sins. Mm -hmm. Collecting and distributing charity. Collecting charity... Be for the poor must be done by at least two people jointly. It is to be distributed by a committee of three to assure just criteria and fairness. If collectors of charity must make change or invest surplus funds, they must do so with others present so that no one may suspect them of deriving personal benefit from their transaction. What do people think about that? That you need to have a witness on charity it doesn't say much about humanity yeah uh, if yeah. all of these different categories from you know charity to eating and whatever need to have another witness what does that say about the people in the world we're capricious people are basically people are basically inherently greedy selfish very self-centered and you have to be taught not to be. I think it is the rare individual who is so altruistic that he gives of himself or charity willingly. I think most people feel uh, that being coerced into giving charity rather than giving it of their own free will. I think it is human nature to be innately selfish because I think being selfish is a survival trait. I am going to survive no matter what, no matter what I have to do to someone else. And you can see this in human behavior in so many instances. So I think altruism, giving and charity have to be taught. And not only that, in order to counteract this tendency to selfishness, then you have to have at least one other person. But as we've discovered, not only in national organizations and in Congress as well, that person may say, okay, I've got somebody who is, who is vouching for me. But if that person is equally as corrupt and is vouching for the person who is corrupt, I mean, at one point do you discover that you need a larger group of people in order to verify that the charity is going where it is supposed to. We've heard of charities in the past. Red Cross comes to mind when uh, the hurricanes came in and the head of Red Cross was accused of not absconding with the funds, but somehow or other they disappeared, all of the charitable giving. And so, okay, um, how do you account for that? I I think you're talking about two different things. You started by saying that people don't give him charity unless they, they're, you know, kind of forced to, you know, maybe religious rules of tithing or something like that. I think in our society, most people are not tithing and they do give to charity. But this, what we're discussing is once those monies are collect or gifts or whatever it is, a you know, food bank, whatever is, you know, it, once those things are collected, the dispersal of those, of those funds, those goods, that's what we're ta they're talking about in here because it's not as personal a gift. It's, it's a conglomerate from the community that is then gonna be shared to, by, in some fashion, whether it's given to the sanctuary in this case or given to other people who <clears throat> need it, you know, uh, you know charitable organizations. 
So that's two different things. Giving, I think people do give to charity um, uh, because they want to, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think when we, once this stuff is collected, that's what they're talking about. Let's oversee what is happening with all the money or the gifts or whatever. No, but the disbursement, in effect, yes, is that's the where you, That's where you get into the weeds. <laughs> because, you know, you know, I'll take this home on the side. You know, I don't have to put this gift in there. You know, I bring some of this, uh, what do you call it, um, mac and cheese home from the food bank for myself right, right? You know, but i mean that's yeah and we and i doubt that is happening you, you know you you might be interested in knowing i i spent many years on a board called the hope school in springfield which we run somewhat on medicaid because we had disability kids and adults young adults who were who are multiply handicapped and mentally disabled and uh and, and we, we and uh it was interesting to try and get money. And, you know, advertise, we spent close to 50% of our budget on advertising. Really? Because that's what you had to do to get, to get. Um, uh, it wasn't super well-known area. You know, the March of Dimes, for instance, which was started for polio, like uh, by President uh, Roosevelt. Uh, no, Bell. Uh, you know, very easy to get money now. They do it for them problems. I don't know if it, I think it still exists, um, but you know, it costs a lot of money uh, to to uh, advertise to get the money from charity. It's much cheaper, of course, for a church uh, because they give you tight at the time you're at the church. They pass a little offering here, give money, but then they're always soliciting from donors, like like we are here. We had, for instance, the golf party. Uh, I, I sponsored a, span, a, a sand trap myself. Because <laughs> so, I was when I played golf, I was known as Marine. I was always in the water with sand. So I don't know anymore. But but anyway, you know, that costs money to 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 to, uh, to advertise those things. So you can get money for the charity. Steve, you had your hand up. Yep. Uh, I'm also talk wanted to talk about the accountability of uh, our nation and others who are helping the the people of Gaza, you know, with this ship and 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 all these goods that are wanting to you know to help with them. But the point is, is they still need to be accountable. We need to be accountable for what we're sending them because we don't want Hamas to take take those goods uh, away from the Palestinians. So we need to be accountable for what we're giving them so that they don't have weapons, you know, to to fight back. And that's, that's a problem because once it gets out of our hands- I know, I know. I don't know where it's gone, you know. Exactly. I think you work it because you, know, you, gotta, you gotta remember Hamas, you know, Will Israel really be able to defeat Hamas? Recently, the U.S. Uh, the CIA just sent an intelligence report that said they didn't. They think very, very unlikely that Hamas will be completely defeated, because when you think about it, Hamas is insinuated in the people of Gaza. I was watching uh, the other night on TV these people. And there were young men. There weren't any women. They were all young men. And they were getting the grain. And I thought to myself, how many of those young men are actually members of Hamas? You don't know. I think that's one of the problems with Israel. They, they don't know who is Hamas and who isn't. And when they bring the people further back north, up in the what, Gaza City, Hamas might just reinsinuate uh, into that area because... The young men who they think are Hamas are Hamas. It's a very sticky situation that that is is I don't think is a is a is a win situation. I think it's a quagmire. Myself, Marcia. It's a different situation. We're we're talking about a kind It's my turn. About, about, <laughs> about, and, and you look at the United United. Uh, the uh, World Health Organizations or not, the UN's um, uh, food program uh, had Hamas members, uh, high-ranking members on their uh, um, uh, body. Mm. 
So, you know. Now? What do you say to that? <laughs> no, now, no. Uh, the, I saw it years ago. I saw a television show where it, in Pal it was in uh, the Palestinian uh, area where they were teaching um, little kids to hate Jews. I mean, yeah. it was like, it's the Jew, kill the Jew. Those people are brainwashed at this point. It's And I don't believe there's a Palestinian that wouldn't kill any Jew that came down the street. And to say to these people, to the Israel, Israel, to say we want a two-state solution, it's going to, it's just so contrary to what they know will happen when we do that. And not we, but Israel would do that or approve of that. It's really a difficult situation. And when you look at it as an outside from the rest of the world looking in, they're not seeing that. They're just seeing all these poor little kids who'd stab you as well as look at you if they knew you were Jewish, you know? And so I really have a real hard time with all this that's going on on the news about all this. And I don't know how anybody else feels about it, but that's so, you know, yes. Maybe. I agree with Marsha because speaking of Lester Holt, who used to be my favorite reporter, <laughs> the guy that he has on, on that goes to Israel, I just forgot, Richard Engel. Yes. I think he has totally taken over for the Palestinians, yes. the Hamas. He now wears one of those schmatas around his neck that yes. tells you right away that you're a Palestinian. And he's always talking about the poor children who are starving but doesn't he remember that this whole thing started because Hamas killed children and families? And now this poor family who waited all these weeks to find out where their son is, and they find out that he died on October 7th. Right. I mean, this is not fair reporting and it's not considered journalism in my opinion. It's just this man who works for NBC has decided to take the bad, the bad side. Jewish. Rather than the good side. I think he's Jewish also. Well, Richard Engel? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think, think so. I think he is, but I'll look at why, it. Why why are we really so concerned about the Gazans? I mean, everybody seems to be uh worried about the Gazans and not as much concerned about the Israelis. But think back, think back when the atomic bomb was dropped. Was anybody concerned about 300,000 Japanese? There was no concern about them at that time. So why should we be concerned about the Gazans? <laughs> because the media is pushing it. That's why the media is anti- oh, You don't have to live, you don't have to live with the media. Yeah. Well, I think it has to go, it goes with the UN also. Then. Everything that's presented in the UN, UN is seen worldwide. And Israel has never been on the good side of the UN. They've always been on the side to blame something on. And in this case, when the world hears what's going on, they don't really care about what's happening in Israel. So they feel sorry for the Palestinians. Sai, so that's how I look at it. And... Palestinians his father, his father, are the ones, Donna, Donna, you're next. Donna, you're next. The Palestinians are the ones that, over the course of the many years that I lived there, it was always going on a problem. They, they're the ones that walked into pizza parlor and shot up the pizza parlor and killed every, every adult and and uh, child that was in there because it was a school holiday. And they're the ones that walk into restaurants. They're the ones that drive up to a, a bus stop and shoot there. These aren't uh, innocent people, and they oh. support they support those that do things like that, all of them. And each one of them, all these quote unquote Palestinians, which there are none, um, could live in their former Arab country, but they actually have more freedom by living in Israel. They shop in the same supermarkets I shopped in. They went to the same doctors that I went to. They uh, they lived there, quote unquote, peacefully until they certain certain number of them, and you never know which ones are going to do that. And uh, so all these people, the, the four Palestinians, the four Palestinians, 
I get so sick and tired of hearing that. Right, I agree. Uh, Richard Engel's father is Jewish, his mother is Swedish. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you Googled that, Marsha? Googled it just now. I was listening, but I was Googled it. Yeah, I just get so upset when I hear this so legit going on yeah. and knowing how they really feel about you know the Israelites and no matter I mean they gave them all that money to well, we know to build up their uh, area and whether they do they build tunnels so I mean Gaza Gaza was a beautiful place when Israel gave that uh, to the uh, Palestinians so to say it was a beautiful beautiful place. There was fruits all over, and they were raising fruits and vegetables, and they shipped all over the world. And the first thing that they did when they got in there was uh, tear up all of that. And uh, and they were being hired by the Israelis in the, in the kibbutzim outside of Gaza. Uh, the the, the, the uh, Israelis were doing this out of the goodness of their heart. And they helped them, and they worked and all all this time Palestinians were taking down this house has so many people in it and this house has so many people in it and this house has even a dog in it and there's two safe rooms here and there's a safe room there. They were taking down all the information that uh, Hamas had to use on October 7th and nobody talks about what happened October 7th no one says all the kids that were killed, all the babies that were beheaded, all the people that were running out of their burning houses from their safe rooms. And then as they ran out the door, they were shot. Nobody talks about this. Nobody talks about the, the number of, of uh, hostages that are there. Yeah. Well, Donna, the last part of it is that the uh, Hamas photographed, videoed all of the atrocities that they were committing, and it was never shown on public. It was shown only to a few select American officials, but never broadcast. And it was deliberate suppression of these atrocities so that they could propagandize the poor Gazans and the terrible Israelis and people have already forgotten that it was Israel that was originally attacked. Nobody remembers that. And so what can you, what can you do? You've got you've got the dissemination of information that is skewed, slanted against Israel and I have no idea what we can do about it. I certainly can't think of, of any way that we can overcome this really it's a travesty that the pub Publicity is so pro Arab and anti Israel. Yes, Steve. Steve. Okay, so we're in, under the discussion of accountability. So, how do we uh, account have Hamas or the Palestinians or the Israelis be accountable for what their their actions were? I mean, that's that's the the crux of the whole thing, as far as I'm concerned. Pam? Yep. How about the United two. Nations? Can the United Nations step in? They don't want to. Uh -huh. they're, they're not powerful enough. They're, I don't think they're powerful enough. They're pro Israel, pro Palestinian anyway. That's right. United they're Nations. Not pro Israel. Yes. And there are a certain number of Jews that are against the Jews. Right. There used to be, I don't know if it exists today, but a group of Jews down in, I think they were mainly in Florida, called the J Street Jews. And they were basically anti-Semitic Jews. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as long as we have a certain number of, of Jews in the country, um, and as you say, this this reporter, everyone thinks he's Jewish. You know, come on. Well, how, wait, how can you be an anti-Semitic Jew? I just can't. I know. Yeah. I see a lot of uh, Israel people from Israel on TV, Jewish Israel, Israelites, okay, talking about being pro-Palestinian, and I don't, and, and they, they, they're like you, Donna, they're saying the poor children, the poor children, you know, and you know this isn't so, you know, and and sometimes I actually, I don't know, but I think a lot of the 
visuals that we're getting from Gaza or taking pictures of the same neighborhoods that got beat up and are not really showing us what's really going on down there. I don't know if it's true or not. Hmm. We it's can't hard to tell. tell. Yeah, can't tell. But hmm. I think we're totally off course here. Yes. <laughs> oh, I agree. I agree. I agree. I think. But you know, it 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 all it all it's all defined by accountability, and that's all what we're talking about. All yes. the piece, yeah. Yeah. But uh but if you know we take it back down to the scale of community and, and um honesty within government, I guess is what we're talking about, you know. And uh but they said they said in the thing though that Moses said on um, that the accounting books had to be public and open to all the Israelites. And I think that was to try to design some accountability into the system it must have been a lot of mumbling going on <laughs> not really i mean it there must have been people saying oh they're living so high in the hog what's going on oh, or it can't say the hog yeah. but <laughs> in that kosher but it, it's um it, it, people are the, it, moses is living so well what about us why don't we have our fair share it's always going to be going on so hey, you had to be accountable you know well, the question I had where it said that Moses insisted that the accounting books be public and open to everybody, did it, could everybody read the accounting books or were only certain select people? Well, but you have to, well, I don't know when, Ruth, that was before, that was before the era of every Hebrew being taught to read Hebrew as such. And so... Maybe we're giving them more credit for being more educated than they actually were. But the box that just read oh, it's the second one, part one of it. One at a time, please. One at a time. Hand up. Uh, Marcia. So in the box menu just read, the second part, it says, if collectors of charity must make change or invest surplus funds, they must do so with others present so that no one may suspect them of deriving personal benefit from their transaction. Mm -hmm. So that's, I don't know who Baba Batra is, mm -hmm. but um, that, I mean, they're saying that you need overseers. Okay. Well, it's, I think it's the same thing where a lot of companies, when there's a lot of money involved, there's always a second person. Yeah, isn't it, part, isn't it part of um, uh, local, local laws, national laws, whatever, though, I don't know, bookkeeping laws that you have to have auditing? Yeah. But don't some companies also require two signatures before any money can be? Yes, our, our temple does. Yeah. You, yeah. And any money is moved in or out, they have to have two board signatures, certain people, I guess the executive board. The yes. executive board. They yeah. don't call it the executive board, but whatever they call it now. <laughs> and um, they, they have to have the two signatures before they can do any banking. Plus, it also protects. I mean, if I was doing something like that, I would like to have someone else overseeing what I'm doing because it protects me also. That someone can say, yes, oh. she did that correctly, whatever. So I, I like the idea that there's somebody else who can, you know, Say that, yeah, yeah, that that happened appropriately, Steve. Uh, what about Bernie Madoff? God help you know, him. He he scammed all these all these investments, and um, you know he stole. But there was nobody, at least from the information that I remember, uh, there was no one overseeing him in his transactions. So yeah, he he stole and and he was found guilty and he suffered the consequences by killing himself. He was Jewish, wasn't he? Yes. 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 Yeah. That's why people couldn't understand because he's I know just just beyond NASA and other major Jewish organizations and little aside from the little old ladies. Cy and, and Richard have their hands. Oh, I was going to ask you. Think anybody. Audited the Pharaoh. <laughs> mm. I mean, we talk Good about question. audits and we talk about gold and silver. I mean, the Pharaoh had it all. If it you're a king, you can do that. Him. 
if you're a king, you don't need auditing. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't think you can make someone audit someone who's that high up in the, uh, whatever. You uh, Richard, you had your hand up. President's taxes, though. Uh, a little technical stuff here. Go ahead. Someone asked right. about the oh, Bob one, one at a time, please. One at a time. Richard someone asked Hirsch. about the Bob Abatro, so I looked it up. Yeah. And Bob Abatro, or Bob Abatro, is a Jewish Babylonian Aramaic Romanized. Uh, it is the third of three Talmudic tracts, uh, and it deals with personal responsibility and rights. There you go. So it's it's a Babylonian Talmud, which is I think considered the more or third one. There's a Jerusalem one and a Babylonian one. I think it's Babylonian. You're right. I think yeah, right. Babylonian is because it was earlier than the Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When someone said before that perhaps um, the people were not as, as educated as what um, they believed them to be, but it depends upon where your education is. I, I consider myself a reasonably ed educated person, but to look at uh, and do anything with the, uh, uh, the budget or how things have been spent, I am lost. Those papers with all these numbers going across and up and down in whichever way, no, I would be the wrong person to say, help edit it in this or help uh, do whatever. Not a bookkeeping maven. No. Um, <laughs> how about if we return to the reading? Okay. Okay. Minya? <laughs> Using Moses as an example, the teachers of the Talmud held that public officials should always be above suspicion. Their actions and those of their families should prove their honesty and integrity. The rabbis point out that as models of behavior, those who prepared the special fine bread, special fine bread offering for the temple never allowed their children to enjoy any of it. In this way, no one could accuse them of profiting from their office. The same rule applied to members of the House of Aventinus, who were experts in preparing spices for the temple incense. They never allowed their daughters to wear perfume, even as brides, because they did not want anyone to suspect that they prospered or took advantage of their service to the temple. For the teachers of Jewish tradition, the appearance of honesty was a critical factor in a assuring public trust. They ruled, for example, that officials of the temple treasury, when taking an offering, were not permitted to wear clothing with pockets. Also, they were not permitted to wear shoes or sandals. Why? Because if such officials become rich, others will assume that they have taken money from the temple treasury for themselves. Jewish tradition maintains that public officials must be above suspicion. The community must have full confidence in the integrity and honesty of those chosen to serve. Handling the funds of others demands open and careful scrutiny. Just as Moses made a detailed public accounting of his collection and expenditure of funds, so all public officials are to be held to such high ethical standards. So you think in general that us as Jewish people have high, high ethical standards that could, because we feel that you know we're kind of required to. Evelyn, uh, if you recall, when uh, Bernie Madoff made the scandal sheets as such, most Jews that I knew cringed because we were horrified to discover that someone, a member of our tribe could have been so unscrupulous. And we feel that way about everyone, whether it is um, or Shapiro or any of the others who have in one way or another slandered in effect Judaism. Uh, we associate good deeds with Judaism. And so when someone does something so blatantly outrageous we as a collective feel a sense of guilt and shame. Right. Yes. I Some people say us Jewish people are good with guilt. We know. <laughs> we honor it. <laughs> right. Marcia. 
so so often you know, somebody you'll hear something in the news about some, with what person that did something terrible and you in your family somebody who turns well thanks oh. he's not jewish <laughs> you know? so i mean you wow. could and people do expect jews to be dishonest because they are so good with money because they are so educated and, and know the law and such that they think that they're going to take advantage of it. And a lot of people do, you know, a lot of Jewish people do. It doesn't mean that we're blameless, but we like to think that we, we know the difference and we know what, what we should be doing. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I felt. Donna? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Sorry. Anyone else? I don't know. Mentioning uh, Jewish, uh, I was just thinking of Jewish money lenders over the millennia. Jews were not allowed to carry any possessions except whatever wealth they could could carry, and so um, they became the money lenders for. Uh, I'm thinking of all of the European rulers, leaders, and would lend them money. And of course, as in many instances when the rulers decided that they really couldn't pay back and had no intention of paying back, would expel them from the country. Yeah. This is essentially what happened. So the Jews would go somewhere else. And it the association of money lenders and Jews became a pejorative term, actually. And there was a book I recently read um, that mentioned a Jewish money lender. This book was written in the 1950s, and there was still very strong anti-Semitism, which died down a little bit after that. And of course, it's made a resurgence right now. But there's an awful lot in literature where they 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 use the Jewish money lender in a very disparaging way. And the expression that I still hear today is. Somebody got Jewed down, and it is it, it makes me cringe. But that's how people view so many Jews, and it is an unfavorable uh, look. That I don't know whether we will ever be able to change people's perception of what Jews are like. Marcia, well, I before you even spoke, Evelyn, I was thinking about Fagin and Shakespeare. Yeah. Like yeah. Eponymous, is that the word? Okay. He was, the, he's like the example of the crooked money lender, you know, or, or whatever. And then, you know, uh, and, and dishonest and such, you know, and kind of sneaky. And so this has been in literature over the years, you know, over the centuries. Don't think negatively. Remember two weeks ago, the lady who gave a billion dollars to the medical school. Nice yeah. Jewish lady. Yeah. A billion dollars asked for nothing. Her, for her husband, it was her husband's money. Yeah. Who cares what it was, you know? It's... Yes, but he said to her, choose a place. And this, she decided to give it to the medical school so that all students there would have free education. Well, that was really Forever. Forever. Right. Well, it you know in perpetuity yeah that's yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. that didn't get too much publicity unfortunately oh that got a lot no <laughs> oh, it did get publicity all it over my computer it it made a lot of news broadcasts and it was all over the internet I mean. Uh, Yes, and it made an impression on Jews. I guarantee you the Gentiles didn't think anything of it. <laughs> well, but they're going to be the beneficiaries of it, it. And it's only for that, you know, for that medical school. But it's school. Einstein Medical it's School. Einstein, and it's it's great that, and she she was a teacher there herself, so. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's you. What did you? Yeah. Other thoughts? Okay. Well, I, I think we, we didn't get too much in the political weeds, which is good. No, well, <clears throat> we tried. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Next week. Have to leave. Okay, bye, Sai. Um, next week, we start uh, the book of Leviticus. So we're halfway done through... Um,
a reading so far. That's my portion, defining sin in Jewish tradition. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that should be interesting. Yeah, well, I think so too. Actually, it's really a difficult portion. It's may I'm not sure going to do next no, week. It's, portion. It's, it's prayer and good deeds instead of sacrifice is what they're talking about. Yeah. But, um, I will try. Uh, so Steve, do I don't think we finished the whole. Uh... Yeah, we. Yeah, we, we did. That was we, we, that was the end uh, of the reading. That, every, everything else is is questioned and study discussion. Yeah. Okay, you're right. You're right. So There's we're, only we're a done couple of questions page. in there, uh, but yeah. that um, reflect. But the only only question is is would you agree that standards of accountability for public officials ought to be higher than the standards of those who serve uh, they serve, and why? I would say yes. I think I, they have to set a good example. So, otherwise, you can't expect the other people to get along if the officials aren't even going to do the right thing. Exactly. Because the public is, it's actually all the public's money from taxes, and et cetera, that it, they are administrating. So they, they should be more accountable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else before we uh, conclude? Mm -hmm. Okay. Pam, great job. Thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to Marsha's leading to us next week. Yes. And uh, the rabbi will be back after that. Mm. Where is he now? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, haven't seen, I haven't seen any posts from him yet on yeah. Facebook or anything. Yeah, Where's witness Walter, protection. Right? <laughs> So, but I, I, all I know is, is he's riding a bicycle. Yes. All over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's conclude then with a blessing, and then we can move on with the rest of our day. Okay. Baruch Blessed is Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, who has given and planted within us eternal life. Blessed is Adonai, the giver of the Torah. Amen. All right, everyone, have a good rest of the week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Good job. Good job, Pam. Bye -bye. Take care, everybody. Okay, okay. Bye -bye. Pam, before you leave, can I ask you a couple questions? Sure, I'll stay on. Okay. Gonna go. Anyway, my question is, is we're trying to work on this Mitzvah Day project, which is Sunday, April the 7th. And <clears throat> I was talking to Dave earlier about you know that section of of land between the the two parking lots yes and uh he came up with a, a couple of suggestions one is to get an estimate of clearing all that out but doing it in within with a matter during a period of time not all at once um i think that that's probably a project that's more than what we can handle as as a small community as we are then the other thing is is if there's anything in the biblical garden that you want us to do i'm thinking we're probably only going to have a small group of people doing this yeah. so uh if you have some thoughts as far as how to uh you know, well, put people to work in that area trimming and stuff that's up to you i'll let you decide that but uh i need to know something before uh then so we can publicize it we haven't even publicized it yet yeah so. well frankly the area that you're talking about really needs it first <laughs> yeah i know i know yeah. but we can and, afford to do that right now right and i think it's and and the biblical garden you know we, you know we work on the biblical garden but this other area we haven't touched and and it really yeah. needs it so yeah. i would put i would put the efforts toward that other area 
and and get it done. Okay. Yeah. And then, right. so because it really it really doesn't you know we've kind of been negligent on that area. I know. Well, it's just like I said, it just got overgrown and it just got to the point where it wasn't manageable. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. Um, huh. Okay, I got a meeting um, tomorrow with the Team TBS. We're going to talk about whether it's going to be feasible for us to pursue it or or maybe wait and, and have uh, professionals do it. So Yeah. No, I think, yeah, that's a very good question, which okay. is better. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Very good. All righty. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll see you Friday night, hopefully. Friday night. I will be there. All righty. Take care. Thanks yeah, again okay. for leading today. You did a good job. Oh, I tried. <laughs> I know. It's it's tough. Yeah. It's tough when you're not familiar with the material. and Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, it's such a great group, but I just wanted to do my best. and You did good. You yeah. did good. Yeah. All right. Okay. Take care. Thanks, Steve. Say hi to Dave. Yeah. Bye. Say hi to Bob. Bye. Bye-bye.